Good morning. morning. Welcome to Good News. This week we continue our worship series called The Epiphany Orientation. God takes the way that we view reality and he helps us see it differently and for the better. This week we focus on an epiphany orientation on our identities as members of Christ's kingdom. It's easy to think of being Christian as kind of this invisible thing that's just kind of out there. But today, God shows us that he connects that invisible reality with a visible anointing. A few notes for this morning. Uh, As you may notice, Pastor Bauer is not here. He's feeling a little bit under the weather, and so he decided it's best for him to stay home. Another thing you might notice that's a little bit different this week is we have our new hymnals, the Blue Books. Um, You'll find them in the seats in front of you. Thanks to our uh, hymnal breaking in party, we're able to use them this Sunday. Another thing you might notice is a little bit different is our worship folders. So because we have the hymnals, we're able to use a hymnal software which helps us put together these beautiful worship folders. So the hymns are still printed in the worship folder, but you're welcome to follow along in the hymnals as well. We'll follow the order of service found in your worship folder. As always, it'll be on the screen up front. We'll begin with the opening hymn found on page four.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who paid the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as the called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. We pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, the children are invited forward for the children's devotion.
Good morning, guys. Good to see you all here. All right, your question for today. How many of you guys drove to church this morning? You rode in the car this morning? Okay, <laughs> good. All of you rode in the car this morning. How many of you were driving the car this morning? Hopefully none of you, right? <laughs> all right, you guys came to church this morning. You came with your families, right? You came as a family. You came with parents. You came with your dad, right? Uh, maybe you came with siblings. Some of you came with siblings, right? You came with your family. So I guess the question is, how do you know that you're a part of your family? There might be a few ways, right? Maybe you share the same last name as your family. Maybe you kind of look like your parents. Maybe you all live under the same roof. You love each other very much. Maybe you have one of those infamous pictures in your house where your whole family is together, right? You know that you're all part of the same family. But how do you know that you're a part of God's family? Because after all, you can't really take God's last name. You don't look like God, right? God is invisible. There's no family picture or family portrait with you and Jesus and everyone else, right? Well, today we're going to hear that God does give us a sign so that we know that we're a part of his family. And the sign is baptism. So in baptism, God takes water and he takes his word and he washes you, forgives your sins, and marks you. He stamps you as his own child. He makes you a part of the family and extends the promise to you that if you believe in Jesus, he'll take you to heaven. He'll take away your sins and he'll give you eternal life. And just like how you didn't have to do anything to be a part of your family, you don't have to do anything to be a part of God's family. He's the one who does the work. He's the one who makes you his. He's the one who died on the cross and rose again to give you you life. All because he loves you. All to make you part of the family. Let's pray about that. Dear Lord, thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit on us in the washing and renewal of baptism. Help us to cling, with it, cling in faith to the promise that through your son, through his life and his death, we have life with you forever and that you have made us part of your family. In your name we pray. Amen. Our first reading for this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16. Ignoring what is outward and obvious, the Lord identifies and anoints his choice for king. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest. Jesse answered, He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance, 
and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went up to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing the psalm of the day. We'll read the verses responsively. Why do the nations conspire, and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord, and against his anointed. The one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger, and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading comes from Titus chapter 3. God's kindness and love and our justification and hope as heirs are all delivered through the visible act of baptism. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. gospel for this morning, which will also serve as the basis for today's sermon, comes from Luke chapter 3. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more pow powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
Good morning, everyone. As much as it is sort of disappointing that I'm unable to be with you there in person this morning, I still am very thankful to be able to share this message from God's Word with you today. The Word of God to which we turn our attention this morning is written in today's Gospel, recorded for us in the words of Luke chapter 3. It was one of those traumatic events that you never forget. Back when I was in college, I went to one of those stores that they used to have. Those stores where you could rent movies that were stored on those little round, flat discs so that you could take those discs home and then play them in a special disc player so you could watch the movie on your TV. Do you remember those? Well, as I was checking out at one of those video rental stores that they used to have, the lady behind the counter informed me that I had a late fee associated with my account. Now, never mind the fact that this late fee probably amounted to nothing more than pocket change, even for a college student. For me, this was an assault on my character. This was an absolute affront to my good name. And so thankfully, with a little bit of back and forth conversation, we were able to get to the bottom of it. Turns out there was another young man named Jonathan Bauer who happened to live in that same town at that same time. Of course, cases of mistaken identity can be far more consequential than that. In fact, this past week, I read about some tragic events that happened back in 2006. The events involved a van full of college students who were going down the highway when they were hit head-on by a semi-truck going in the opposite direction. Very sadly, the, the families, the parents of five of those college students had to be informed that their children had died in the crash, including the parents of a young woman named Whitney. Whitney's parents were informed that she had died. Whitney's parents mourned their daughter's loss. Whitney's parents had a funeral for her. Whitney's parents even went to a cemetery and saw her casket lowered into the ground. But a full five weeks after the accident had taken place, Whitney's parents found out that a, another young woman who had been in the crash, a woman who had been injured severely but not killed, who had been in the hospital recovering little by little, getting better and better, that this other young woman was in fact their daughter Whitney, that she was alive. Cases of mistaken identity can cost people far more than, than just a late fee at a video rental store. I mean, can you imagine if those parents had never found out the truth, if the true identity of their daughter had never been revealed, if they had gone the rest of their lives without that incredibly good news, if they had gone the rest of their lives without that life-changing reality? Well, in the very same way, a case of mistaken identity can be just as costly for you and me. A case of mistaken identity not involving someone else, but instead involving us. It is absolutely vital. It is a, a matter of life and death. In fact, it's a matter of eternal significance for us to know our identity, for us to know who we are and what it is that gives us value and worth. And this identity is not going to be established by a driver's license or a passport. It's not something that can be verified with fingerprints or dental records or a retinal scan. Instead, this event, this identity needs to be established by a single event. A single event that took place, first of all, in the life of Jesus. A single event that, second of all, takes place in our lives, too. A single event that's really at the heart and core of the verses that are in front of us today. As we look at these verses from Luke chapter 3 this morning, we're going to see that this event called baptism is the cure for cases of mistaken identity. Now, you can completely understand the case of mistaken identity that's described in these verses. Luke has been telling his readers about the ministry of John the Baptist. I like to sometimes think about the work of John the Baptist as it compares to the work of today's preachers and today's churches. You see, these days, preachers and, and churches might be tempted to think that in order for anyone at all to come to hear God's Word, in order for anyone at all to come 
to church to gather together to hear God's word. Everything needs to be as easy and convenient as possible. The service needs to be held at a convenient day and time. The church needs to be in a, in a very visible location that's easy to get to. There needs to be ample parking, plenty of comfortable seating, needs to be heated in the winter and air conditioned in the summer. And then, of course, when it, when it comes to the message that people are going to hear, it can't be anything controversial, anything challenging, anything that would otherwise make people feel uncomfortable in any way. And only then, only if everything is, is just right, only then, maybe, just maybe, some people will show up. Compare that to what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist set up shop way out of town, way out in the dry and hot wilderness down by the Jordan River. I have a feeling there weren't a ton of cushion chairs set up there for people to sit on. I have a feeling that after he was done preaching each day, John didn't serve people delicious glazers from Quick Trip or nice hot coffee. In fact, speaking of sermons, there was nothing comfortable, nothing convenient about John's message. John told people to repent of their sins. John told people that baptism was the only solution, the only way to be forgiven of their sins. There was absolutely nothing easy, nothing convenient, nothing comfortable for people to go out and hear this guy named John preach. And yet people were heading out to the Jordan River in droves to listen to what this guy had to say and to be baptized in the Jordan River by him. And so it's no wonder that Luke tells us what he does. He says, he says the people, people were waiting expectantly and were, and were all wondering, wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. The people, the crowds, the crowds of people were impressed by what was obvious, obvious to them, by what they could they see, by what was right in front of their faces, and so they were left wondering, wondering might, might John possibly be the promised Messiah? Messiah. Well, in well, response, response, he tells us, that John told the crowds that by focusing on what was obvious and apparent and, and right in front of their faces, the people were settling for an inferior version of what the Messiah came to be. John told the people that the actual Messiah would be much greater than him, would be much more powerful than him. Yes, John could take a little bit of water and, and he could put it on people's heads. He could baptize them, but he needed to rely on God to send, to send his Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit to work through that water to forgive people's sins. But in contrast, the promised Messiah of himself, of his own authority, would baptize his church, would pour out the Holy Spirit on his church. And yes, John could tell people to repent. He could tell them to turn away from their sins. He could get people ready for the judgment of God that was coming. But the Messiah would actually execute that judgment. He would be the one who would separate the wheat from the chaff. He would separate what was fit to be gathered into the barn from that which was fit only to be sent and thrown into the fire. By focusing on what was visible and obvious, the people were settling for something vastly inferior to what God had promised. And that very same case and very same cause of mistaken identity can still happen with us. As we think about our identity, as we think about this, this all-important question of who we are and what gives us value and worth, it's only natural, I suppose, that we focus on what our eyes can see, that we focus on what's obvious and apparent. So maybe we focus on things like our popularity and our reputation. How many friends do we have? What do people say? about us? Do we get invited and included in all of the, the really fun and important events and, and parties that are happening around us? Or maybe we're tempted to focus on our accomplishments. Is our name on the door of that corner office at work, or are we stuck in some crowded cubicle with another coworker? Are we part of the starting lineup, or are we stuck riding the bench? Or maybe, or maybe we're tempted, we're tempted to, to, to focus, focus on our, our actual appearance, appearance our, our, our looks, looks, our beauty. Our beauty. Is the bathroom, the bathroom scale, scale our best friend, best friend or our worst, worst enemy? enemy? Do, Do the, pictures the pictures that we take of ourselves and post online, online get all kinds of likes, likes and all kinds of comments from the people, from the people around us? It's only natural, only natural that, that we focus, focus 
on things that are obvious, on things that we can see. And, and I suppose you could say that none of those things is inherently evil or wrong. I suppose you could say that each one of those things could be a blessing from God. But let's be absolutely clear about one thing. As the basis for our identity, as the definition of who we are and the basis for our value and worth, each one of them is vastly inferior to the identity that God wants us to have. You heard what the Apostle Paul said to Titus in today's second reading. God wants us to have an identity where we see ourselves as born again. We have been born again. We have been adopted into God's family. We are his dearly loved children. God wants us to have an identity where we realize that in Christ we are justified. Where God is able to look at everything that we've ever done in our lives, all of our accomplishments and all of our failures, and still in Christ gives his complete divine stamp of approval. God wants us to have an identity where we see ourselves as heirs of eternal life. Where no matter what might happen to us in this life, no matter what we might have or not have, we know that we've already been written into God's will. And that everything that happens in our lives and everything that happens in history has the goal of bringing us to that eternal reward. That's, That's the identity, the identity that, that God, God wants, wants us to have. If instead, if instead we focus, we focus on, on, on what's obvious, obvious, on what we can see, on what's right, right in front of our faces, faces we'll inevitably be settling for something vastly inferior. Well, thankfully, well, thankfully in, in cases, cases of mistaken, mistaken identity, identity, God is God pretty, pretty good, good at clearing, clearing things up. It's exactly, exactly what happened, happened on, on the, the banks, banks of the Jordan River that day. There the people were all wondering, all wondering in their, in their hearts, hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah, Messiah. Impressed, impressed by what, what they were they seeing from him. him. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, Jesus, up until that point, that point was just was another, another nameless, nameless face in the crowd. In the crowd. But, then but then God, God changed, changed all of that, and he and changed, changed all of that when Jesus was baptized. When Jesus, when Jesus was baptized, baptized there in the Jordan River by John, by John. God, God caused heaven itself to open up. And the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus visibly in the form of a dove. And then God the Father himself spoke from heaven for all to hear. He said, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. God cleared everything up when Jesus was baptized. God made it very clear that Jesus was the Messiah and John was not. Jesus was the Son of God and John was not. In fact, God made everything so crystal clear that if you didn't know any better, you'd almost be tempted to think that no one ever questioned Jesus' identity ever again. That from that point forward, no one would ever challenge the claims that Jesus made about himself. That from that point forward, everyone would just embrace Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. That these events on the banks of the Jordan River would soon, would soon be followed be by a coronation, by a coronation in, the in the palace in Jerusalem, an endless, endless adoration, adoration from all of Jesus' people. But of course, but of course as, you as you probably know, know that's, that's not what ended up happening. happening. Even, though Even though Jesus' Jesus identity, identity was, was cleared up at his baptism, baptism after, after that, that, that identity, identity largely, largely remained invisible. invisible. It's not, it's as, not as, as if from that point forward, Jesus walked around with some sort of special glow on his face that set him apart from the crowds. It wasn't as if there was this beam of light that shone down from heaven on him and followed him wherever he went. No, in fact, the, the two specific things that John mentions that would sort of be the epitome of Jesus' work as the Messiah, those things didn't even happen until Jesus had gone back up into heaven. Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit on his church on the day of Pentecost, ten days after his ascension into heaven. And Jesus, and Jesus will judge the living and the dead. He will execute God's judgment on the day when he comes back. In fact, there's really only one person who seemed to get the message loud and clear, who saw this case of mistaken identity completely cleared up and never once forgot it again. Only that one person was Jesus' great spiritual enemy, the devil. 
Immediately following his baptism by the Jordan River, Jesus went off into the wilderness, and for 40 straight days, the devil did his very best to put that identity of Jesus to the test, to get him to doubt it. After these fireworks on the banks of the Jordan River, what, what followed after that almost seems like a bit of a disappointment. And as much as we don't want to hear it, the very same thing can again also happen to us. That identity that God wants us to have, that identity that's, that's vastly superior than any that we could find otherwise, it is ours. We are God's children. We are justified. We are heirs of eternal life. And Paul not only says that that's our identity, he tells us that that, that identity became ours in the very same way as it did for Jesus. It was given to us through baptism. But as much as that identity is ours, and as much as it is truly amazing, it largely remains invisible. And that can lead to some disappointment, to say the least. In fact, you know what I think about it? I think any time a case of mistaken identity is cleared up, there's bound to be some disappointment. As much as there might be relief on one hand, there's probably disappointment on the other. The fact that one Jonathan Bauer living in New Ulm, Minnesota, doesn't have a, a late fee on his account means that another Jonathan Bauer living in New Ulm, Minnesota does. And of course, far worse, as much as it would have been great to be the parents of that young woman named Whitney, to find out that their daughter was actually alive, there is, of course, a, a flip side to that story. There are the parents who sat by the bedside of that young woman that they thought was their daughter and watched her slowly recover, little by little, that slowly gained more and more hope that she would once again be well, only to find out that all along their actual daughter had been dead and her body already put into the ground. Anytime there's a, a case of mistaken identity cleared up, it can very easily lead to disappointment. And, and that can be true of us when we think about the identity that Jesus clears up for us in our baptism. baptism. Child, Child of God? God? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely it's true. true. But that, that doesn't, doesn't instantly make us famous. famous. That, doesn't that doesn't instantly make our social calendars fuller. fuller. Justified, Justified forgiven, forgiven, perfect, perfect in God's, God's sight? sight? Absolutely, that, that is true of us. But that doesn't that mean that we start walking around with a, a halo floating above, above our heads. heads. It doesn't mean that we instantly stop acting selfish and inconsiderate and proud and stubborn toward others. Heir of eternal life, yes, that identity is absolutely ours, but that doesn't mean that everything instantly starts going our way. It doesn't mean that the balance in our bank account or our stock portfolio instantly skyrockets. That identity that we have through baptism is ours, but it largely remains invisible in this life, and that can lead to great disappointment. Which is why it's so important for us to remember where we should look for proof that that identity is ours. You know, as sophisticated as the methods for establishing people's identity become, they're never perfect, are they? Driver's licenses and passports can be stolen, and they can be forged. Even fingerprints can be fabricated. In fact, you might be wondering how in today's day and age, with all of the forensic science that we have, how the, how the identities of these two young women, women could have possibly been mistaken. Well, for starters, the two of them looked quite a bit alike. And then secondly, as first responders arrived on the scene and they, they tried to collect all of the, the personal belongings that had been scattered far and wide around the scene, from this, from this terrible, terrible crash, crash. One, of one of them mistakenly put the ID of Whitney with this other young woman and the ID of this other young woman with Whitney. And as much as that led to some, some very sad misunderstandings, it's really a wonderful picture for what God has done for us in baptism. In Jesus' baptism, our identity was given to him. Our sin, our guilt, our death became his. So that in our baptism, his identity could become ours. His innocence, his holiness, his life 
should become our possession. And in fact, it's a, it's a wonderful blessing. It's a wonderful thing that proof of this identity is not found in what we can see in our lives here and now. It's not found in what we feel and experience right this second. If it were, then that identity would be a fragile and delicate thing. It would seem safe and secure one, one moment and then shattered into a million pieces the next. So thankfully, that identity, invisible as it often is, is unbreakable. And it's, and it's unbreakable because it's based on something that's already happened, something that's done, something that's finished. Jesus' baptism that joined him to us and our baptism that has joined us to him. That is the unbreakable, unmistakable identity that is ours. And if you're ever looking for proof, when you're in desperate need of proof, look no further than your baptism. Amen. Please stand. We continue with the remembrance of holy baptism. Holy baptism is the priceless means of grace by which our Father in heaven connects us with Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. The Apostle Paul wrote, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism in or into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Again, Paul wrote, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. In holy baptism, God takes away our sins and gives us new life. We reject the devil and confess that we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I ask you, do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? Yes. Do you believe in God? The Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of bodies, and the life everlasting. Amen. Is it your sincere prayer and desire to remain faithful to your Lord Jesus, to value the word and sacraments, and to live a life that pleases God? May the eternal God, who saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, as your Son fulfilled all righteousness and submitted to baptism in the Jordan with sinners, to your good pleasure, you opened the heavens for us and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. As you have joined us to Jesus' death and resurrection by the waters of holy baptism and given us your spirit, strengthen our hearts and open our ears to hear your holy word and rejoice that in Christ you have made us to be your beloved children too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the family, O God, especially all Christian homes. Turn husband and wife toward one another in love. Equip fathers and mothers for their holy callings as teachers of the faith, and preserve all children in the saving faith and certain promises of their baptism to life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all power, all the might of nations and kingdoms is nothing before you. We ask you to give your blessing to all those who serve your people in government, the police, firefighters, 
emergency medical personnel, disaster relief, and the armed forces. Give them good and honest hearts for their service and lead them to know and do what is good and right for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, at his baptism, your son voluntarily took on himself all our frailties and the results of our sinfulness. Give your comfort to all who mourn. Extend your healing hand to all who need your care. Assure them of your promise that even when your people walk through the fire, the flames will not consume them. Grant them faith to believe that they need not fear, for you are with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious Father, we commend ourselves and all those for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, whether that's in person or online. At this time, take a moment to let us know that you're here by scanning the QR code on the back of the service folder with your phone or by going to goodnewslc.org slash connect. If you'd like to give an offering in support of our ministry, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash give. Please stand. We pray. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn. 